welcome to another episode. Another, they just keep coming every week, Gary. It just keeps happening. What is this? What's that all about? <laughs> What's this all about? Welcome to another episode of Tea and Tales Podcast. I'm Eddie, and I'm just a normal, everyday mum. There's nothing special about me, and I'm not going to say anything else. And I'm Gary Twins. No yeah. more shenanigans this week. No more <laughs> shenanigans. Rain that in because there's nothing that drives me more about mad in podcasts than when they they they're dirty or they swear because I I often listen to them in the car and I go <laughs> come here, ears, children. Grab a cuppa and break off a bit of your favourite Easter egg. It's okay if it's not Sunday yet. We're not judgy. It's okay. What would baby Jesus say? Baby Je- 40 days he spent in that desert and you can't even wait till... I reckon he'd be pretty chilled out about it, to be honest. This week, we share the mics with the Oracle of Sports Science, Emily Arell from Precision Fuel and Hydration. We have another Tales from the Trails. Pop over to Strava. We announce our Beat It Sports competition winners and share our weekly deets. Uh, Hello. And thank you to our Patreon partners who share some awesome discount codes with our Patreons. We have Precision Fuel and Hydration, Velo40, Protein Rebel, Tiki Boo, Mountain Fuel, Outdoor Active, Silver Sweden, Active Root, The Centurion Running Store, SportsShoes.com, Big Bubble Hats, X Miles, Fawn Cyphon Cottages, Yugoku Projects, Red Best Sports, The Album App, Retainer Group Cycle Protection, Summit Crazy, Beat It Sports and Lumi Active. Another knowledge-packed newsletter, very timely too, with marathon season fast approaching. It feels like, probably because I've immersed myself in marathon running for this spring, most of my friendship group are doing marathons. But yeah, not one, but 51 marathon case studies over at Precision Fuel and Hydration. Yeah, go and check out the case studies I did over the weekend. It's not just for regular folk like us. There are elite athletes fueling and hydrating over there for their goal races. Yeah, fascinating. Go and check it out. Thank you to Precision Fuel and Hydration for sponsoring the show this month and also for lending us Emily, sharing all her knowledge on electrolytes and fueling. Oh my goodness, I am pounding. This is not set up. This is live. This is real life. I have drunk (laughs) two of these Precision Fuel and Hydration (laughs) bottles of electrolytes already this morning because, Gary, I'm getting a bit sweaty because the, the mornings here, they're chilly. They're chilly. Got gloves on. And then by the time I finish my run, I'm absolutely boiling because I put too many layers on because I'm an, I just can't go out cold. I can't do it. Put too many layers on and I'm really dehydrated. Have you had a sweat test yet? I don't think Eddie needs a sweat test. I think just being around Eddie, uh, generally you would realise that there's always a light layer of sweat. <laughs> <laughs> I need to have a think about how I'm going to take, because these case studies that I was reading, they give you like sodium recommendations per litre. And when I'm doing a fast a trail race is fine because, you, you know, you're carrying lots of stuff. You've got your hydration vest. But when you're doing a race, I carry my gels, but everything else as far as electrolytes. Down your sports bra. Pop your yeah, sports, I might have to buy, salt buy tabs, some of their, down your, their salt tabs. Yeah, that's probably what I'll do. Salt tab um, down yeah. your sports bra. I thought you were going to say I'm going to have to buy a sports bra. <laughs> <laughs> but I've never done that. <laughs> put it past you to go, I'm just going to wear a sports bra, actually. If it would get me under three hours, Eddie, you're like good for age. <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> But yeah, I've never, I've always carried my gels and just relied on the hydration and the electrolytes from whatever's at the yeah. feed station. So have yeah. to think about that. If you're a Patreon, you get 50% off over at Precision Fuel and Hydration Towers and anyone can get 15% off their first order with the code CAPSLOCK T24. Super simple, CAPSLOCK T24. How's it going, Edwina? What? <laughs> Oh my God. What is your week? Gary's been got like? like Gary's got like stress itches because we had to start recording a bit later today, and he was like, "Oh, I don't like being hurried." He, Gary, you wouldn't enjoy my life, I don't think. I don't think you'd make it. I don't think you'd make a day. <laughs> I'd be Tuesday. I'd be time out. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie, what the hell? Um, yes, it was. Oh, it was. It was all right, Gary. Oh my God, this. Nothing is ideal preparation into a race, though I have had a few messages from people saying, Eddie, there's a lot of whining going on from you in the podcast and you still manage to do a lot of running and a lot of strength work. (laughs) I get that, but I'm just, it's my outlet, guys. So let me have it. (laughs) You guys listening, you're my only friends. You're the only people I talk to. So you're going to get it. All right. I had to take two rest days last week, Gary. Holy, you would have died. You would have actually probably not done the marathon after that. I would not have coped well with that. You would not have. One was planned and then the other one 
something happened. We won't go into it. It's so dull. But I had to be at home all day. I just couldn't. There was just no time. I couldn't get outside. Two complete rest days. Nothing happened. <laughs> but a lot happened. My yes. rest days are not sitting watching <laughs> Netflix eating ice cream. One day was planned because the weather was awful and I sorted out my kit, talked about that. The next yeah. time it was just so busy. I just, it, it, the life just exploded this day. And, and I just couldn't get out. It was just all too much for me, Gary. Uh, I think I did about 30,000 steps anyway. I was so busy. Okay. What are we going to do about this team? That's our uh, sort of last big week. So I focused on what always, you know, back to the basics, focus on what you can control. So I focused on with the less volume, I was slightly less tired and creaky. So I was able to really put some quality into the sessions. So I did two sort of like speed endurance typey sessions, one longer flat reps on the gym treadmill, which I love. I love that treadmill. If I had, I reckon it, co- I need to look up and see how much it costs. It's just so bad. You feel like Paula Radcliffe on it. It's, I'm sure I look like <laughs> yeah. her too. It's amazing, um, doesn't it? I absolutely look. I can't believe we've not got a goddamn treadmill sponsor. Come We're on. Gush. On, treadmills come on, every guys. week. It is literally though. It's in the, my gym is in a dungeon. You know, you've seen it. There's no walls. There's no light. There's no life. <laughs> and it, the treadmill is just up against, I promise you, a concrete wall. It looks like it's in prison. There's nothing to look at. I'm like, love you guys at the gym. But this is like, you could put this upstairs. You could have it out in daylight. But no, yeah. no wonder no one's ever, ever on these really lush treadmills. Anyway, I find it hard as I freshen up a little bit, not to rinse myself on these sessions because I'm like, my finger goes to that speed button of like what but your words are ringing in my ear do not beat the workout so i'm really strict i really focus on my heart rate and i don't push it that little bit harder second session this week was such a disaster okay second session it was an unplanned hill reps and i literally made it up on the spot because i has i had such rage because i was meant to be doing going up skiing powder with Bryn. yes you might say that is okay. not a good idea to do 10 days out from a 200 mile race but we wanted to go together and then it didn't work out that way some errors were made and I had to stay at home and I had to stay at home and it's always me that has to stay at home and it's always me <laughs> anyway I had such rage so I was like right. they, they, we had this sudden dumping of snow and I couldn't get outside well I, okay. I ran the dogs outside but I was like this is I can't do anything on this you know productive on this terrain so I went back it's inside. awesome though you can problem solve and then you just set yourself a session Moving on. Well, I think anybody who has got a busy life or has got kids, that you learn that being able to change on the fly. Okay, that's not going to work. What am I going to do? That was literally my week. Anyway, I'd been really wanting to watch Henrietta Albans Bob Graham round yeah, film. I'd yeah. seen it, and I'd like I love oh, I'm such a sucker for a montage of Jeopardy and all those vistas and everything. So, I, so I actually <laughs> planned my session around the film. I looked to see how long it was, and it was thirty minutes. You can do a session while you watch something, but I can't. So I was like, right, I'm just going to run up hill for 30 minutes on the treadmill and just enjoy the film and just be like nice and steady pace couldn't find my heart rate monitor which again that did not help the rage so i just was like i know gary you would have just spinned it off but i'm hardcore (laughs) um so i just got i got on the treadmill started running got about i think i got about 1500 feet climbing while watching the film it's amazing. You can just find it on YouTube. It's so well filmed. I think James Appleton did a lot of the filming. Um, the biggest takeaway from it, I won't spoil, no spoilers, so she has been on the podcast, um, is that Martin, who does her sort of road crossings and crew support, he says, I'll make you a cup of tea, like about halfway around. She's like, I've never drunk a hot drink. Why would I drink a hot drink? And he's like, he just, I think, you I just didn't see this, but I think he was like, <laughs> you just wait. Anyway, she ends up, she even talks about how good this cup of tea, and there's a picture of her drinking this tea. So I love that. I thought it was very appropriate for the podcast too, the fact that one of our big takeaways was how good the <laughs> cups of tea you are. Yes, my sort of girl. Definitely yes. helped the record. Anyway, so and uh, so I'd done about half an hour uphill. I was already in a muck sweat. Hadn't had any breakfast, Gary. This is, oh, I've been really, oh what my the God. hell, Eddie? <laughs> I started to feel really ill. So I just went, opened my bottom drawer and got out every Velo Forte product I could find <laughs> and uh, and just whammed some gels down my throat. And I did six by three, three minutes at 12%. I couldn't find my heart rate. I couldn't see my heart rate. So I just just went at like what felt horrible. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then because I'd had this unit of time that I wasn't going to do, wasn't going to have, I, I wasn't going to be able to fit in my third gym session this week. And then I thought, I've got an hour. 
shall I just go straight to the gym? Much you sweat, the guys. Dice. I, oh just, my I was like, right, let's just do it. I'm just going to take all my clothes off. Sorry, dear podcast <laughs> listeners. Put on more clothes and just drive straight to the gym. No thought. Don't think. Don't think, just do. And in my head, all I was thinking was that picture of Jasmine Paris hanging over the barrier with like, oh, oh my God, my dream, my total dream. She was absolutely <laughs> ruined. She just had like um spit coming out of her mouth yeah. her hair was, and I was like that what oh my god my total absolute hero so all I was thinking was like I think I can go to the gym on limited fuel and very sweaty and do this workout which I did and honestly it was such a hard workout tried to like stuff food in my face but the, the damage had been done <laughs> but all I was thinking because it it's, this one's got sled pushes it's got ski ergs it's got box jumps it's uh, squats it's heinous heinous all I was thinking was like, she can do that. I can, come on. Did you not have some kind of sugar crash though? Because your gym sessions are so much different to mine. All the way through, Gary, I was honestly, I was just like, this is good training. This is not, please, dear peeps, this is not good training. But it was just where I got myself in such a, anyway, I, the gym closes at midday. Everyone had gone. It was deathly silent. I was waiting for the man to come around and lock it up. I was just lying on the floor, unable to, I was like, I'm just going to lie here. I'm going to lie here until somebody comes and says the gym's, and if they don't, I can just lie here. And then when I got up, there was just like this sweat mark of me. Well, uh, like, oh. it doesn't matter. It gets cleaned. <laughs> Anyway, oh Your gosh. Your butt so, sweat on the floor, my goodness. I had two good workouts, but oh my gosh, it was not easy. But I did have a good last long run. Oh, so nice. I love, I love 200 mile pace. Full backpack, everything in. Was slightly nervous when I lifted the backpack, when I put in like the waterproofs and the mid layer and the base layer and the fuel, 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 fuel battery pack. I was like, geez, how heavy is this going to be? And my poles. Um, I was like, oh, is this going to be quite, it is heavy but it's not spine heavy so it felt fine it felt fine cruised around for four hours and the so much snow had melted i was able to get quite high up into the ski resort where the pistas greeted me like old friends for the first time i saw them and then the second time and the third time i saw them because i was just like doing loops around <laughs> trying to get some fun and they were like <laughs> but they were so funny they were like oh Oh, she's here. Trail running season has started. <laughs> <laughs> Hi guys. Anyway, got to about three hours and this will be, this will be the time when I start. I will, I'll have a couple of um, precision fuel nitration, like gels maybe and shots up to three hours and then I'll start and then I'll probably start a sandwich into the race and so I thought I'll take my sandwich and I'll sit on a little rock with the dogs and have a little moment always like that at the end of training blocks reflect anyway went to get my sandwich and I was like oh no it's no. it's in the fridge it was a leftover sandwich from the day before that a child hadn't eaten as well. So it wasn't particularly, <laughs> I wasn't particularly excited about eating anyway, but I was looking forward to it. My tummy was so empty. I was like, oh God. Anyway, what would Killian do? I was listening to a podcast with Killian on it about how he'd done five days with no food and fuel at one point to see how far he could. Oh my God. So I was like, well, Killian can do five days. I can probably run down three miles back. <laughs> I, didn't. I can't even do 20 minutes in the morning let alone five days. <laughs> I'm so relying on fuel I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not I've got so good at fueling all the time that when I don't my body's like oh my god anyway but it felt good I was really happy to tick that off got lots of climbing in that too lots of ups I tried to run the downs though it was really greasy and it was like mud ice or snow which so I was like don't fall don't fall now did all my strength finished my hardest strength sessions Gary 30 hours it ticked over my little app to say I'd done 30 hours of <clears throat> weight training that's so that's awesome Gordon I love it. that's awesome I'm really happy to see like I, I hope this taper is enough time now to let that strength come through and the legs feel strong definitely what I've the big thing I've noticed is that when when I was climbing up the really steep climbs they're literally like really really steep up some of the piece I wasn't getting the like lactate buildup and the calf burn that I usually do. The legs just felt, I was going easy. I was watching my heart rate to be like, right, make sure this is an effort you could sustain for hour after hour after hour. But the legs just felt really strong. And so fingers crossed. That's with a the good taper. place to be in, Eddie. I love it's it. It's a good place to be in. 
What's the time? I know it's people are different. Everyone's slightly different, but it's it's about three weeks, isn't it, for that adaptation? Yeah, two to three weeks. So yeah, so uh, but I I definitely feel. I mean, I, when I'm just recruiting all those muscle fibers, I feel better for doing it within a couple of days. You suddenly yeah. think like, oh yeah, the glutes are working, the hammies are working, the calves feel better, etc. Not my perfect week. B plus, Gary, B plus, but I did the important stuff and everybody lives, everybody carries on. I'd be over the moon with a B plus. Be sensational. You would not. You're you're a solid (laughs) A. You're a stand up guy. How is my dear friend? Oh, well. I was going to say something. (laughs) (laughs) Last big week of training, really. So, yeah, not too shabby. Ultra Mont Blanc I review is out. Oh, and people love it. Oh, they hate it. But like us, guys. Well, this is, I was just going to say, it's really subjective because everybody's different. Everyone's mechanics different. Everyone, Everyone's foot is different. And I think we mentioned, I mentioned this when we spoke to Mike and Stuart, there's with apparel, this does that under these certain, certain conditions. But footwear, yeah, really is subjective. And what one person loves, another will hate. So yeah, sometimes you do have to take these reviews with a pinch of salt, but two strength sessions and I upped the weight Ooh, a bit. I enjoyed that. Yeah. Jeopardy. I know. 20 kilograms. I, I, <laughs> did you put no, some only, weight on the bar? <laughs> about five about five kilos on my shoulder presses and my deadlift. So yeah, I upped it. But then ironically, now I'm in the phase of training where it's going to be higher reps and lower weights. So I'm going to be dropping it down for the next couple of weeks when I'm in tape. But the session, six times one K at 10K pace, 90 seconds recovery. And that did feel quite short compared to some of the sessions I've done in the past. And I think that was because I had one of these hour-long marathon session runs again. And I I ran the marathon sessions. I'm such a div, honestly. I, I ran know, the I, marath- saw. <laughs> I saw. We all saw. It was like, what was it, 6.37s, which was my June. London marathon pace when I PB'd in 2019 why did you choose this is non-judgy a little judgy sounds a bit why judgy why did you do that on the treadmill and not on the road we just had horrendous wind basically it wouldn't have been um, <laughs> yeah I could have done it and um, some of the some of the miles would have been fine some of them wouldn't well that was supposed to be part of my long run but I'd already you'd already run 84 with- miles with Rex no well the next life. day I'd already set up a run with Aaron um, which was going to be 15 mile, just easy on the trails. So then that couldn't have been my long run with marathon. I get that. I get specific. that. So that's why I did that nine mile on the treadmill. I could have probably done a half marathon at that pace, not a full marathon. It's really, well, it is a bit depressing when you think, goodness me, I could, I could run a whole marathon at this pace. And now it's, uh, yeah, so much tougher, but it is what it is. And I feel like a pro on my 15 mile trail run. We've got all these resources, Eddie. We've got Velaforte, Protein Rebel, Precision Fuel and Hydration. And I feel that on Tunnock's way for biscuits. <laughs> it's absolutely awesome. Because, you know, you hit a, you hit a little hill, you know, I'm going to have a little little snack now, a little Tunnock's biscuit. And if anybody can make this happen, you know, the Inside the Factory program of Greg we talked about the other week. Oh, my goodness me. If somebody could make a factory visit to Tunnock's factory up in Scotland, <laughs> I would be in <laughs> debt forever and ever. And unlike you, when you were saying you did the four-hour four long run, I'm actually not looking forward to going back to those four, you five will, hour long You will. You will. You <laughs> will. You will when you can go to the lakes. And those, yes. it, like, I loved mine because I was getting up in hills. I haven't been up for in, I haven't been up in for like six months because of the snow. Yeah. So it went really quickly because I was like, I've not been on this trail all for ages. So you, when you can get out and go somewhere different. True. I think, but, but for where I live, I've got trails, you know, I've got trails, but they're not really, not going to get loads of elevation there. So for me to do, a, say, Lakeland 100 specific long run, it involves probably a three hour round trip plus four or five hours on the trail. So yeah. it's such an epic day out. While yeah. training for marathons, it's super easy. Just I know. stay well, local. That's, yeah. gonna, that's your future now then. Just just because it's really interesting. I really enjoy all the chat. Love it. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I'm starting to ache and creak because uh, as the miles go on. So back on the form roll, some mobility sessions. My hammy is grumbling in my lower back too. Now I, in the past, had 
problem with my lower back, like a trapped nerve. So I just need to pay attention to that. You know, I've got all this, all this way in training right up to tapering. It would be such a shame if I just nicked that nerve now. I had an epic lent fail oh. on Friday. I crashed hard. We had a family gathering in a local work and men's club, which involved a buffet. I'm only human. Um, it, it tasted delicious, but a buffet and Gary is not a good mix. I have no, oh, I even had beer. I'd love it on a t-shirt, <laughs> buffet plus Gary. I know, <laughs> I I think, I think, I at the start of the podcast, Baby Jesus judged you hard for the Easter egg <laughs> comment, but for that, I think he would have wanted you to... Enjoy yourself. You deserve yes. that buffet. And That's what I felt. I thought I yeah. needed to just give myself some grace. A little blowout. A little blowout. Oh my gosh, I love a buffet too. Where oh. everything's slightly brown fried, crunchy. <laughs> yeah, loved it. But I did feel a bit grubby when I woke up the next day. Oh. But the week, yeah, well, 85 miles, all the sessions done. Feeling and creaky. But yeah, we've made it. It is taper time. And I did look back at my heart rate variability. I've not really talked about heart rate variability because I'm kind of been oh feeling okay God. and yeah. it has been yeah more days it's been green for wow over four weeks i couldn't go back any further on strava so four weeks of green i don't remember ever doing that so when i'm thinking about consistency in my strava bars once i'd got over dragon's back race and started training again there was a little incline in duration and yeah they've been pretty consistent when i look at all those markers hrv consistent 80 plus miles always hitting the workouts always going to the gym and now we are tapering it's on eddie it's, it's gonna happen how <laughs> different how different our races are. they couldn't be on more on the i know it's wild <laughs> they could not be on more of a different spectrum but um we'll have some stories to tell we'll have yeah. some stories i keep i kept thinking yesterday this time in two weeks oh my gosh i will be on my way everything having gone well finished hopefully you know i'll have done a big chunk of the race wherever yeah. i am whatever's happened even if i've had to book into the <laughs> some hotel for a sleep i will be making my way towards the the, the other coast and i was like oh but I it'll be awesome it. you'll be in it Does you'll be in the like race i'll be in it and i love being in it i don't yeah. like the first i'm really not going to enjoy the first five hours and then once you're in it you're in it Everybody's calmed down. I remember Trish bumped into me in Conway before the Dragon's Back race, and I was a bag of oh, nerves. You I was were a complete mess. Remember. But then, you know, rock up day one in camp after the first day, you were just in it. It was a dream. You just need to. And that's one of the big things I learned with the spine is big mega races. Let the first day go. I know that's mad. <laughs> and the same, the same will be for your marathon, you know? First three or four miles, you might be like, oh, it's too fast. Oh my God, my hamstring hurts. Oh my God, my head. And then you'll be in it and that will all go. The noise will go and you'll just be like ticking off those six minute Ks. Hey, we've got to give some kudos to Jasmine Paris, though. We don't often, like, we don't often mention races and stuff because this is very much like a, uh, we're just not that podcast, are we? We used to do race, lots of race results and stuff, didn't we? Yeah. But uh, this is a podcast for you guys to keep your company and um, inspire. And wow, I don't think there's a bigger performance ever, ever that would... I don't get inspired by... No, I I'm get inspired, super inspired by my kids, my kids or, yeah. um, you know, my family or something like something they do or, you know, they're the, they're the people that drive me. But that... I mean, I love her. I love everything she embodies. I, it's just such a huge crush. Bigger than the crush I have on you, Gary. I love Impossible. everything. She, I, I just want to be more like her. And the kids, we, so she was on the BBC News, so we always make the kids watch on Sunday night before Country File, and they were like, Mum, like, uh, I was like, she, you know, she shunned any sponsorship. She came back. That's her third attempt at that. And they were just like, so is she faster than you? I was like, yes. Oh, we thought you were quite good, Mum. I was like... <laughs> <laughs> well, I try. I try. She tries really. I think she tries a bit harder than me. Anyway, <laughs> I was like, I love the story of her never giving up and coming back. Yeah. The work that must have gone in to that picture. It gives her. us all hope, I think. I you think dream so. big and you keep showing up. But you have to work. You have to yeah. work so hard. And I think in this day and age, it's probably if you've got kids, you will know that 
teaching you've got to work the work that goes into anything it yeah. you know you see overnight successes but she must have worked the three years like the work that's gone into a performance like that as i said earlier her hanging over that barrier and lying on the floor that's everything to me that i got is, very emotional that yeah. last minute when she was running in the last couple of minutes it was wild <sighs> Uh, I can't imagine how many people will not just in our sport will, will have seen that and thought, okay, you might feel, I did feel slightly like, but I'm never going to do anything like that. I can never be like that, but I can use that to be the best that I can be. I yeah. can use that to, to keep showing up, you know, when you get a B plus week. Okay. I just showed up. I kept going, which, you know, use her mindset and not be distracted by any other noise, you know, totally focused, does her thing. I love it. She does her thing. A few press interviews, turns yeah. it around, walks back out. And uh, what, what a lady. Everyone's asking when we get her on a podcast. She has been on the podcast before. She's very private. We will ask her, but we will also respect the fact that she's been on the podcast and she might want to walk away and leave it there as well. But we will ask her. Um, but we will also send her big congratulations and big love as well. I actually sent a message to my mate, Katie Carr Saberstein, who's a friend of hers too, going, just checking there is somebody that's going to be looking after her now and bringing her home. Yeah. <laughs> Because Auburn and I were thinking was, oh, my God, can you imagine what the next 24 hours is going to be like? The body, the Rinsing. mind. You need somebody who's just going to keep handing you tea and <laughs> water. And and she said, yeah, her husband was out there taking care of her. I've done nothing to compare. So, yeah, I just can't imagine what she's her recovery is going to look like. For all those people that uh, were inspired by her as well, take a little bit of Jasmine into our everyday life now yeah. too. Brew the coach's time and this week Patreon Nick Breen got in touch looking for a bit of help and advice. This week's Brew the Coaches question comes from Nick Breen. Apologies, Nick. This question came in at the end of 2023. This year, I've completed one marathon and 250Ks, and it's been the most successful year as a runner. Next year, I want to take the jump to a 50 miler, but I know that I'm going to have to make a bit more effort, both in terms of consistency and with strength and conditioning. Looking at my Strava bars for the year, they are all over the place. Whether it's a rolled ankle or a niggle elsewhere, I can't seem to nail down more than four weeks or so of consistent mileage. Even in my most recent training block, the 50k I ran last weekend, there were two weeks which I only managed one run. One because of a cold, which always seems to hit me in training blocks, and one because of shin splints. This year, I've also suffered with something akin to plantar fasciitis and a few rolled ankles. None of these injuries have been long term, but they've been enough to disrupt my training and prevent me from logging consistent weekly miles. I sleep well, eat well, and I'm always careful not to increase my mileage too suddenly. I'm definitely not a fast runner, and my easy runs are easy. I can only put it down to a crappy strength and condition. In. I try to fit in two sessions a week, but if I'm honest, it's more like one and sometimes none. My sessions are also quite short and I never finish them thinking, whoa, that was a good workout. Sorry for the waffle, but my question is, and I know it's a tough one, what are the key exercises that I should be doing at home to become a stronger runner? It would be great if you could share your workouts or maybe suggest a few exercises each. Any other advice on consistency would be great. Thanks, Nick Brain. Nick, well, that must be so frustrating, just that stop, start, stop, start all the time. That would drive me crazy. Rebecca, yeah, anything, maybe any red flags, maybe from a medical point of view? I think what, what Nick describes, and, and thanks for this question, um, is probably not uncommon to lots and lots of runners that we really struggle for consistency in our training. Lots of things occur in life to, to sort of knock us off a, a path, let alone things like little niggles and injuries that occur, things like colds. In terms of red flags, I would say there's a lot of sort of minor injuries there or sort of little overuse type injuries, which probably belie the fact that maybe that under, underlying strength and conditioning isn't where it probably needs to be. And you're probably in this bit of a pattern where it's a boom and bust, really. You sort of go for it, something happens, it tails off to virtually nothing, and then you go again. So even though 
you're paying attention to things like sleep and eating, not trying to increase your mileage too suddenly. Something's probably still off in that balance, really. And I think it would be, as you've picked out yourself um, at the end, asking about exercises, I think underpinning this is going to be a really consistent strength and conditioning program. And I think if you can adhere to that and make those the absolute minimum sessions you're going to do, you will see the dividends of that. And in usually not, not too long a period of time. So six, eight weeks, you can certainly see strength gain. And I think if you make those sessions sort of important when you're coming back from injury, so rehab yourself properly and then not really worry about the mileage um, at all until you've completed that. Um, I think in terms of the colds as well, it's not unusual for us to get numerous colds, particularly if we share our life with children. Um, we're going to be picking up stuff all the time. And it's not necessarily something deficient in you, you know, in your immune system. It's just that we come across these things and we are susceptible to them. And we're more susceptible to them if, if we are sort of overtraining. So it is one of the red flags that we think about, but it's not unusual in itself to have the odd cold i think it's how you generally feel whether if that's accompanied by periods where you feel very fatigued or anything else i would certainly want to look at that but i think again it's about just allowing yourself recovery so when a cold hits accept that you're not going to train to what you want to that week um, and then regress it a little bit and build it back up and just accept those things are, are part of life as i say particularly if we've got children it will just be a, a fact of life you're going to pick up various illnesses during that period of time but yeah certainly paying attention to what you're eating sleeping i generally just take a multivitamin with iron plus a vitamin d tablet that's just my sort of standard things to make sure i feel boosted and make sure i've got enough of everything on board particularly when you know diet and things can can, can go awry at times, can't it? I would say, Nick, you are an absolute prime candidate for a little bit of help with your running and your programming um, in order to get that consistency. I would say maybe have a little reach out, have a little look around for a coach. I think people think, oh, you know, I'd only have a running coach if I'm an elite runner, if I'm looking to tra target a 3.30 marathon or anything like that. But actually here, this is where I do a lot of help with people is like helping them program their sessions into their life and making sure that it's sustainable for that consistency and that it's at the right level and often holding people back so that they do, you build yourself back up very slowly and gradually. And you don't need to worry about it, Nick. You don't need to put the energy into what should I be doing? Oh, I can't fit that strength. The first thing that goes always is if you're busy, the strength and conditioning. Uh, that's going to go, that's not going to fit in. But your history, that's the thing that should stay. So having somebody like in your corner a little bit going, these are the exercises you need to do. Like you said to us, these are the exercises that you need to do. We need to do this twice a week. You need to report back to me that you spent that 20 to 30 minutes doing that exercise. And then alongside that, we're going to rebuild you really slowly and carefully. But you're going to be able to rebuild because you've got that foundation of strength as well. So I would say maybe have a little think about that. As well, you said um, um, something else I thought, oh, careful. Was it even your last training block, 50K? You only managed one run. Um, don't beat yourself up. Maybe Strava isn't the thing for you as well. Worrying about the blocks, what's happening. Focus on you, Nick. And this is where, again, it might relate to a lot of people. It's something, Trish, you probably have the same. The the amount of time I spend talking to clients about comparison being the thief of joy, comparing themselves to others, what others are doing. There's no right way, horrible phrase to skin a cat. And you will see people do really well on really low mileage, but you don't know what they're doing in the rest of their life. You will see people do really well on really high mileage. You don't know what they're doing the rest of their life. So just focusing on you, much more healthy, much more healthy approach to training. And it, that will also help with your consistency as well, Nick. Yeah, I, did, I totally agree with that. I'm not, I'm not even on Strava and people are shocked by that all the time. <gasps> I mean, I'm on Strava Gary for some of um, like... my clients. I mean, it's not, it's not that I don't care. It's just that I'm too lazy and I'm too busy. <laughs> so I just don't, I'm not even on it. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we run because we love it. Right. So that's the key thing. We want it. We definitely want to get some consistency back in your training. I'm just going to go through some of the things that I think that could potentially help you, Nick. And I think first one is if you want to do, um, with consistency, if you can't run, a good thing to do when you're a little bit under the weather, uh, which will still help, is walk. So you still want to do time on your feet. And if you can walk um, when you're not feeling great, then 
I would, uh, instead of running, I would try and walk. And that way you'll, you won't have such huge fluctuations and you're still, you're still using those muscles. Remember, because essentially rest is rust for a lot of, a lot of joint stuff. And you, you do want to be mobile still. So there's a big difference between having a, a down week where you're just literally sitting on the couch or in bed or whatever, you know, then going back into a normal running week. And you don't, you don't really want to do that. We want to try and keep our body moving as much as possible. So try and help consistency, maybe lower what you're doing, but try and do something every day, whether it's um, running, walking, whatever, try and do something every day. In terms of key exercises that you could be doing at home, I would say with strength and conditioning, if you can, 100% try and get to a gym. If you can't, because that's not available to everyone, it's not an option for everyone, that's absolutely fine. But I would invest in some weights. You can get loads of secondhand weights now um, on Facebook or whatever, because, you know, people got all their gyms and now they don't want them anymore. So if you can invest in some weights, try and get them to use at home. Um, And I would say you probably need to do a good foundation block first where you're focusing on form and then you need to be starting to move into lifting heavier. So a session, for example, that you might do, um, I use a lot, uh, is something like four by fours where you do four set, uh, four reps, four sets, and you'll have maybe two to three uh, minutes recovery in that. And that's lifting heavier. Obviously, I'm telling you a workout here, but at the end of the day, you've got to see if that workout is appropriate to you. And you have to do that heavier stuff with good form. So you must do a foundation block where you are focused purely on form and that is low weight that foundation block okay so that's something you could think about uh, maybe talk about like eddie said with a coach if you want the second thing i would say uh, is the type of exercises you should be doing now i'm going to say three things and they are 100 i think if you can't do anything and you're just going to do three three things deadlift squat single leg movements. Those are three things focus on if you are pushed for time. Okay. And they will make the biggest difference. In addition, if you can do that, focus on some, some kind of push and pull exercise. So you don't want to just be doing, you know, you don't want to just be doing pull all the time. You need to balance the muscles. You need to do push as well. Um, what you've not talked about is your age or anything like that. So as you get older, um, that's gonna that's gonna change how you do strength and conditioning to a, to a point. So that's something to think about as well. The key thing for you is one hundred percent to get some consistency. Maybe get a little bit of some some phases in your training, uh, so you're not just doing the same thing all the time. Try and get some some phases in, and so you're building up to your races appropriately, having downtime and recovery weeks, that kind of stuff. Would you drop some of the weekly mileage? Because the sentence I try to fit in two sessions a week, but if I'm honest, it's more like one and sometimes none. I would start off with one session and just, st- I mean, if you can do two, that's great. But if you are pushed for time, you're better off doing one quality session than two half sessions. Okay. Okay, so go for quality time every time. So if you if you can do thirty minutes of excellent strength and condition, uh, conditioning, do that. You know that that's that's better than doing a kind of wishy washy twice a week, not really doing what you should be. And also, you, know, you you've all said it. You don't need to do loads. If you, I find if I do too much, then that really damages the running workouts I'm trying to do. And it depends what you're doing as well. Like you don't, you don't want to be doing too much heavy lifting. So then it impacts on your, on your running as well. You want to, you know, you want to be doing, let's say you do one heavy lifting piece, but the the next session you do could be more centered on plyometrics, could be more centered on conditioning as opposed to strength. So, you know, there's, there's just too much to kind of go into. You, you just need, um, like Eddie said, I think he probably needs just a bit more, work around what's spe- what's specifically he wants to get out of it and you don't need to buy tons of kit i've got these this dumbbell set no. where it's fundamentally one dumbbell but you remove the plates yeah. to reduce the weight and it takes up no room and for years i'm always trying to remove friction from anything that i don't really want to do so i used to just follow a youtube video and it wasn't ideal but i think it was a situation where something was better than nothing and not everyone has the time and also like the cost as well you know it's not it's not an option for everyone so i you know there's plenty of stuff if you you can do at home as long as you've got 
a relatively heavy weight. There's, there's so many, just, you, you just have to Google. There's so many great exercise out there, especially for single leg movements. You don't need a huge weight. Um, cause if, you you, if you're doing it, a rucksack or yeah. a small yeah. child or a bag of flour or a tin, hold a tin above your head and do some single, uh, do some walking lunges and you'll soon, uh, <laughs> A couple of tips. What about the weighted hike? Walking. Would you could you incorporate that? It's, I'm assuming it's a trail 50 miler. Would a weight, weighted hike? Yeah, yeah, very good. Just you, as Trish always goes on about the load, don't suddenly load up your rucksack and then head yeah. out for a 20 mile weighted hike. Just put a picnic in your rucksack and a rug and a, and some uh, a flask of tea and a big bottle of water, and that's probably enough weight, you know, just to start you off and head out for a couple of hours. Nick. Let us know how you get on. We hope we've been a, l- a little bit of help for you. Yeah, best Good of luck. luck. Good luck. Look. Thanks for getting in touch, Nick. We love your questions. Hopefully the tips help keep things a little bit more consistent. Let us know. If you're a patron and have a question for the coaches, email hello at tntrails.com. This week, we chat with Emily from Precision Fuel and Hydration. We threw at her multiple Patreon questions all about fueling, hydrating, cramping, you name it. We tried to cover it. If we didn't get to your question, we apologize. But she also looked at all the questions and she put them together as to what would be helpful. We love these podcasts that are golden nuggets of information. And we know you're going to love this too. So here's our chat with Emily. If you book a call with Precision Fuel and Hydration, there is a good chance you'll be lucky enough to have a chat with this week's guest. Both of us have gained so much knowledge from our chats with Emily. So we were super stoked when she agreed to come on our Tea and Trails podcast. Thanks for having me. Hi, Emily. We ask all of our guests, where are you? What's the view from your window? And have you, oh, I'm not too sure. Have you been for a run, <laughs> swim, cycle or anything else today? I am sat in a pod in our new office. I think probably the last time you spoke to Andy, it would have been in the old place. We moved just a couple of months right, ago yeah. now. Finally got our own space, which is lovely. Um, and just about unpacking and setting things up. I haven't today yet. What I have been doing actually, I haven't got my own sweat on me, but we've been doing lots of testing in the office. So <laughs> Andy's currently on the bike right now, but we've been like putting sensors on people and testing out a few different bits and pieces so i've been covered in other people's sweat nice <laughs> gary's and dream the, oh, and what's the view from the from the new office industrial estate or quite pleasant onto a main road from what i can see at the moment but the other way uh, is some nice kind of fields it's very muddy at the moment though but um nothing too exciting i'm a runner eddie skier cyclist runner What's what's your sport? Yeah, what sport do you love? I my actual kind of sporting background is is more team sports. I'm a, a footballer by trade. I've always played football growing up and at uni uh, the last few years as well at Bath, which is where I went to uni. But that's my main sport. I mean, obviously, talked to a lot of endurance athletes and been thrown into that world in the last few years. And then did a swim run last year and have been trying to kind of do a few bits and pieces like that which have been really fun do you look at us endurance athletes and think i want a piece of that i want to feel what they're talking about or are you like these guys are just nuts <laughs> i think it depends on the event sometimes definitely the latter <laughs> some of the some of the events in different things yes yeah, super interesting and definitely want to explore different ones like swim run i hadn't really heard of it until kind of a few years ago and, and getting to do that was was really cool do footballers do they concentrate on the electrolytes in their bottles i'm always wondering what they're chugging when they when they're drinking it's not lucasade anymore used to be no <laughs> um yeah it's, it is really important we do actually work with quite a few pro teams some premier league clubs in the uk and lots abroad as well and do the sweat testing with them and help them kind of refine things a bit as well you see a lot less cramp don't you you do see a lot less of the physios running on the pitch with them with their calves up in the air do you, oh emily shaking her head. It's like, nah. <laughs> they're just time wasting though aren't they that's when they get the cramp yeah. at the end when the clock yeah. down no i think the, the science has improved and they're a lot more on it now they've, they've had sweat tests and bits and pieces like that but 
some players are still quite prone to it. it. Depends on who they are. So tell us, Emily, what does a typical week look like for you at Precision Fuel and Hydration Towers, or a typical day, maybe? Very, very varied week to week and day to day. A lot of it is is getting on calls with athletes. So I work with lots of our ambassadors and our and our top level triathletes and runners and just get on half an hour calls with them discussing their strategy like I did with you guys and lots of our customers as well I sit down and talk through what they eat and drink during training during races a lot of my job is actually data analysis so I'll do lots of the the number crunching behind the scenes I'll take people's intake there how many gels what flavor of everything the timing of everything and then I'll work out the the grams of carb per hour milliliters of fluid and how much sodium and then be able to kind of give feedback and help them refine it over time is that what you were always interested in you study sports science at you, at Bath, you said. Yep. Is that what was always like right from the beginning? That was like, that's what you like the day. That's the bit when I did my sorts degree. I was like, the day that blows my mind. I'm born. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I've always loved kind of every sports. Like I watch and partake in, in anything and everything. Once I found out sports science was a thing, that was definitely all, always what I was going to do. And I really like biology. And I also really like data analysis. So I'm a bit, a bit of a nerd in that, in that frame. And, uh, we do lots of Excel stuff in the office and I do enjoy that quite a bit, although many people find that a bit weird. But What's great about you, though, Emily, is that you're, you're a scientist and we could use the geek emoji to describe <laughs> you, but you're so personable as well. I remember when I had my chat with you, you didn't make it sound super complicated. You didn't make me sound like a crazy loon. You were like really <laughs> empathetic and understanding and were like really encouraging. And that's just like a totally different handle from coming from the data. So quite unique, I guess, I guess precision fuel and hydration like we've got Emily keep hold of her she is brilliant <laughs> at this uh, it must be quite tiring though as well because you like all these calls all these people it's like quite a lot of concentration and like listening to somebody's story and then interpreting it and then it's quite an, a- an art I guess as well yeah especially that kind of a lot of what I talk about is the numbers but then you you guys will know a lot of it comes down to feel and stuff like that and it's about like finding the balance of the two and and also yeah simplifying the numbers and, and explaining the science behind them but then also talking about the practical side of things the logistics come into this a lot so it's yeah it's about kind of doing a lot of like detective work to solve some issues and trying to explain the best ways to go about fixing that and ultimately it comes down a lot to the athlete and I can give the general advice but a lot of it is then them going away and testing and lots of trialing and and trial and error and then coming back to me and we it is just a process that takes time as well we're going to dive into some uh we've got some really good patreon questions to grill you with but perhaps if people are listening to this and they're thinking I would be too frightened to book a call with Emily or I don't need to do that. What would you say to anybody that perhaps their finger was hovering over the book a call with Emily button? <laughs> <laughs> I think the calls are so helpful because fuel and hydration is so individual. It really gives yourself the opportunity to to dive into your specific losses with hydration and your specific fueling needs to whatever crazy events that you're doing. So being able to talk it over with a human on the other end of the phone is the best way to do it. You can also just kind of look on our site or anywhere online and find lots of information but there is kind of lots of conflicting viewpoints out there so just we try to make it as simple as possible I do think talking that over is the best way to do that you never do all to learn I've I've been around the block <laughs> oh, I knew <laughs> thought, thought I knew quite a lot and then after a call with yourself Emily yeah my the strategy say for the dragon's back race with the whole electrolyte before and after yeah that really blew, blew my mind and I carry that forward to all my major workouts and races. We've got quite a few Patreon questions, so I'm mindful that we get through these. First one is from Michelle Tikkum Rogers. I find the nutrition side very confusing and I have a very sensitive tummy. I did the Achan Mountain Marathon. Have you seen that? I think it's in the Faroe Islands. That looks sensational. And last September, I had a bowl of cereal in the morning and only two gels by the end. I had no energy. I have the UTS 55K coming up and I'm still incredibly confused with all the different things I meant to take. I also can find it quite difficult to take water. Just myself, a little takeaway from that. 
I would need a lot more, Michelle. My goodness. Yeah, Emily, what, what can you, how can you help Michelle? Yeah, there's there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think firstly, with, with the confusion, there is, there's so many things to consider and it definitely is confusing for people. I think to, to simplify it, our messaging has always been, you need to make sure that you're taking the main three levers is what we call them. And that's the carbohydrates for the fueling. So that's going to keep those energy levels up. And then the hy- hydration side of things is the fluid and the sodium. I agree with Gary. I think it, it sounds like maybe it wasn't too much fueling and you didn't take in very much. And it might be that you need to up that next time to be able to not kind of bonk or hit a wall, as people call it. So continually fueling and, and hit hit those uh, higher levels. With the fueling size of things, the actual recommendations are based on the duration and the intensity. Uh, one good place to start would be the fuel and hydration planner, which is something we have online and you put in your race details and it will give out the recommendations for each of those three levers based on the scientific recommendations. So I definitely think that's a good place to start. And then with the fueling side of things, it's it's common to have kind of stomach issues and, and tummy troubles. And I think it does take time to to build kind of your tolerance and you can train your gut to take in more carbohydrates in different kinds. So I'd work up to building to take more. Don't kind of go straight in with the, the higher end recommendations. You will have issues. It's about training that over time, working on how much you can take in so that you can hit the recommendations and keep yourself fueling. But a lot of that is just practicing it in training. It's, I think, starting it super simple is the answer, isn't it? Like breaking yep. it right down to uh, put some electrolyte in your water and make sure you have a couple of snacks every hour and make sure that it's something that you know you're going to want to eat as well. Because I think people think they try and make it too exotic or whatever and like, just keep it super simple and practice. Michelle, you've not got long. May is UTS, isn't it? So, um, yeah start putting that into practice. And I think as well, like just generally, if you are, if you have a bit of a sensitive tummy and you struggle with fueling in your general day-to-day life as well, but you're dipping into ultras, trying to eat a little bit more during the day is often like just teaching your tummy that a few more calories are going in as well, but doing it gradually and taking your time. Michelle, I think a call with Emily is an absolute must and also a visit over to uh, the blog and there's so much information there and then you can just take your time and read it as well. Definitely. Like gut training takes weeks and weeks and you've got a decent amount of time there to, to build up. The key now is to kind of find out and put a bit of a strategy and goals ahead and then you can and slowly build up in your training and get to the level that you want to be at. It can feel quite overwhelming as well when you are on your run, run on your long run. If you want to really feel properly, it is constant and it can feel like, you know, I'm meant to be out running and enjoying nature and being fit and healthy. And all I'm doing is shoving food in my mouth. You know, we wouldn't be sick. We wouldn't be working and going every 12. Well, we'd like to every 20 minutes. Let's have another. <laughs> Guys, we need to snack. It does feel like, but the more you do it. And if I also think if you surround your pe- yourself with people that are really good at feeling as well, it's much easier because you kind of all start delving into your little snack bags, share the snack make it a like like we all like a meal time with the family is much more enjoyable so if you surround yourself with people that fuel regularly as well it is much easier and you get some good ideas i ate a lot of gary's chocolate m&ms was it gary oh, on peanut uh, m&ms yeah peanut m&ms oh, it's going to overwhelm the system if you don't fuel during your training and then you just all of a sudden on the day of the race it's just this huge huge shock to the system but also your training is much more pleasant when you're not famished and wondering why you're dropping off the back of a group or something like that yeah you really have to fuel you get you get used to the signs too as well don't you if you really dial into that fueling and that regular fueling you almost predict when your watch is going to beat that 20 minutes because your body is used to using the fuel rather than dipping into resources the fuel's there and it's like oh yeah okay here i go again honestly it makes a long run the the last hour of that long run if you fueled it well is such a more pleasant and you're a much nicer person at the end of the long run as well Emily's laughing. Uh, next question from Hannah Hogren Johnson. These people have got some very fancy names, our patrons, yes. haven't they? Uh, Hannah says, I mainly run marathon distance, road or trail races. So nothing like 100k, but maybe one day. What's your advice on fueling these distances? I've listened to lots of people saying wing it on gels and water, but I feel like there might be a better strategy. So I would say... Putting a bit of a plan together is is probably better than winging it. And that is what our our whole ethos is at the company. But what I'd say is what you really want to do is for the longer ones, for the shorter ones, you want to know what you your 
goal is in terms of the fueling, so the carbohydrate recommendations. And as I said briefly a minute ago, it's all about the duration intensity and what that recommendation is. And the, the planner online can tell you, but it's going to be 30 grams an hour, 60 grams per hour, 90 grams per hour. Once you've got that in mind, you can really put a strategy in place, whether that be primarily gels or you're incorporating other things as well. Um, and that's greatly down to preference and also what you're doing when you're going for 100k and it's going to be much longer and a lower relative intensity you can incorporate some more real foods that's definitely going to be helpful and help you avoid flavor fatigue than just relying on gels the whole time but again as i as i said before it is down to preference and trialing and, and finding what works for you to reach those numbers so if your goal is 60 doing some testing see if you can incorporate some bars if that's for you whether you're someone that relies more on gels that's absolutely fine but once you know the recommendation for that during that distance that event that you're doing then testing trialing finding the products that will help you get there there's probably a difference between a trail marathon and a marathon on the road as well gary will testify to this that it just seems so much easier on a road to shove a gel down your face isn't it yeah. than on a trail there's just there's more opportunities to eat a solid snack is there any protocol though emily you said for the the hydration side of it so before before the race and maybe even after the race too, would you load up on electrolytes even for, yeah, for a road marathon or a trail marathon? Yeah, for it's kind of a blanket recommendation, the preload that I talked to you about, Gary. So that's 1500 milligrams per litre or pH 1500 or just a strong electrolyte concentration drink the morning of an event. So roughly 90 minutes to two hours out, I'd be sipping on that just to make sure you're going in well hydrated. So instead of just having plain water, which can flush you out a bit and you could actually start a bit dehydrated so on on the back foot this just means completely the opposite so the sodium helps you retain the fluid you go in well hydrated and i do that no matter what the event is and the conditions it just it just helps you go in well hydrated whether that a road marathon a trail marathon and then what will change is that duration will change in the intensity like you said so for your road marathon where it's going to be a relatively higher intensity the recommendations might change a bit so you might be fueling a bit more and it might be that it's much easier, as you said, to take on a gel and you might use more drink mix when you're going at a higher intensity. Whereas when you're going on the trails, it's going to take you much longer. The recommendations might be a bit lower depending on how long it's going to take you. It still could be the same, um, but you might use a few more bars and chews, yeah. things like that. And what about, say, maybe gels on the start line, 20 minutes, 40 minutes before race? I think we chatted caffeine gel maybe 20 minutes before we start what about that kind of protocol? Yeah, it's again, it's it's down to preference a bit and, and it does kind of, it's different for everyone, but a recommendation that I often do talk about with athletes, and I think is a great one, is within the last, if you can, within that last 20 minutes, having a final gel, caffeine if possible, and if you're a caffeine lover, just to help you spike both your blood glucose levels and your caffeine levels as you're going in. What you don't want to do is have that too far out. So if you have that kind of over 30 minutes out in the like 40 to an hour route, you can spike your blood glucose a bit too early and then have a yeah. dip and have what's called hypoglycemia, where you're actually starting kind of with lower blood glucose levels, which is definitely not what you want. So you want to time that last gel perfectly. So it's spiking just as you're starting. And a way to do that is is testing and trialing and see how you get on with that in training. I'm very nervous about that caffeine gel 20 minutes before a busy <laughs> major marathon. <laughs> yeah, caffeine is a, a whole other a story and, and a lot down to yeah personal preference and tolerance. Like some people are, are big caffeine drinkers and coffee drinkers and others not so much. And that is, again, a bit of testing and, and seeing what you enjoy. But if you're someone who's not kind of a big caffeine user, then 100 milligrams right at the start is definitely not for you. So that might just be a normal gel. Well, I'm going all in. I'm going to roll the dice. <laughs> I, <laughs> and also, yeah, it's 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 a contra... I think the gel over... I used to maybe say walk to the marathon and stop into some coffee shop, but I really didn't have any idea how much coffee, caffeine was in that drink. So the gel really does deliver a controlled measure. So yeah, if you're thinking about that, go for the gel. Go for the gel. Talking of gels... Lee, Lee's yeah. a big fan. <laughs> wow, Lee, if you manage this on gels, <laughs> I'll be giving you so much kudos. <laughs> yeah, question from Lee Bailey. Precision fuel and hydration is my go-to gel. Unfortunately, I consume I can consume dozens in a day. The 300 gram floor gel is great. However, as I'm undertaking the Dragon's Back race this year, can I expect to run on gels for the duration of the five days? What would you advise to be your, is that a calorie per hour? Carbohydrate. Of, carbohydrate per hour and the role of solid foods. Thank you. Well, just for some intel, you will not get anything on a checkpoint on the Dragon's Back race unless they've been super kind and might 
buy a Solero for you if it's red hot. Uh, and sometimes you do walk, run through some towns and you can go into a shop. But with like a traditional, say, race like the Lakeland 100, where every six or seven miles you'll have a checkpoint with loads of sugar, you are pretty much carrying all your own food. But, uh, you know, my own, again, observation, food fatigue, gels, five days, that would be horrendous. Yeah, Emily, what do you think? Well, thanks, Lee, for what you said about the gels. I think what I said previously is it's all down to preference. If you think you can feel the oil in gels, gels are carbohydrates, then you can go for it. But I think it depends on on the individual and the tolerance. With that kind of race, especially we're going day after day, you're absolutely right. Flavor fatigue can definitely occur. If you were to just have gels, you don't want to be sick of them on day two and then have three days where you've just got to force them down to keep fueling you. You want other options and you want to mix it up and you want to have other bits and pieces mixed in there, especially where you can and you can definitely incorporate some real foods into a race like that and help keep yourself going. And also use it as a bit of a reward system and have it broken up and and have, uh, you know, you've got something that you really enjoy coming up. You can really work your way towards that food that you like instead of just relying on gels. But there's nothing wrong with that being the backbone of your strategy but I wouldn't rely on it completely and, and athletes do it completely different ways and and Gary might have used more real foods compared to another athlete but it, as long as you're hitting enough carbohydrates to meet your goals and keep you moving that's absolutely fine and we have some cases Gary has a case study from one day of his dragons back last year and I did a case study on the the female winner as well and she used quite a lot of gels throughout I think more than you Gary but she was hitting roughly 60 grams per hour and that would be the general recommendation for that kind of race but again as I said earlier it depends on what your goal time is um, and the intensity that you're going to be moving at but that's just a rough estimate there for you and definitely solid foods as you asked can be incorporated it's just finding the ones that work for you to help you hit those goals especially when you're talking about around the stage as well obviously you need to get some more sustenance help with recovery you might have some protein in there some fats in there some more carbohydrates to kind of refuel so that's where actual solid foods will be play a much bigger part as well i had a great tip from zoe murphy actually she said because it was super hot so this was i really appreciate it, but pop, pop a treat in you you can put a drop bag roughly halfway and uh yeah don't put all your eggs in one basket maybe have a bag of mini cheddars and or a kind of pop or something in your drop bag. I really appreciate it. That's all I'll say. That's all I'll say, Lee. Such a hero, Gary. If anyone wants to dive back into Gary's Dragon's Back race podcast, we'll put the link to the number in the show notes. That's me. I'll tell anyone about it. <laughs> He's got a t-shirt. Probably got a t-shirt on the end of it. But they're big days. Um, they're 10 hour days, at least. Yeah. That was for me anyway. You know, yeah, the hours. hunger's going to come knocking if you just have Joe, Je- Joe's, if you just have gels, you're going to find that the meal times, your body's kind of l- natural hunger knocks will come. You'll be like, oh yeah, it's lunchtime. I need something. And it's a good way to break up the day, as Gary said, to yeah. have, to have some sandwiches, bananas, cheddars, cheddars, so dangerous because they're quite dry. You need quite a lot of moisture to yeah. chew the cheddars. Um, but uh, I did, I bookended the day with the PH, PH 1500 start and finish pretty much immediately when I finished. I chugged 500 mil of that and I smashed, I think it was like 50 grams of protein too. Literally, that was the first thing I did as, I, as soon as I crossed the line. So it's not just the gels. There's a lot of other aspects to a successful Dragon's Back race. Were you taking about... 70 grams an hour on the on the day that I analysed, Gary. I think so, yeah. And I didn't have any energy fatigue. I think I was potentially fighting a losing battle as far as electrolytes, even though I didn't really experience it, but the math suggests I was um, just in decline over, over the week. But yeah, about 60, 70 grams, grams of carb per hour. I never dipped in any shops, been super stupid, been super competitive. I just... Uh, kept chugging past it but yeah there's so many factors lee to a successful dragon's back race and yeah just reach out if you want any tips i'd uh i'll help you not that <laughs> well i think i did have quite a successful week so yeah any questions just just hit me up slide into my dms <laughs> I'm, I'm possibly checking out the uh the case studies as well of, of yeah. gary and, and robin's they're really interesting Robins. <laughs> to, to compare as well and see what they did differently 
Next question is from Josh Turner. Oh, that's a nice, easy name to say. Thanks, Josh. When heading out for 10 plus hours, the upcoming UTS 50K is in my in my mind. Have you any thought on prioritizing different types of fuel? Is it best to start out on chocolate spread sandwiches at the start and move to gels, chew and drink mix when the stomach is less interested in whole foods? Or is a mix of everything throughout the race perhaps the best bet? I also wonder how pro athletes, there's probably two questions here, isn't it? I also wonder how pro athletes might be getting in 90 to 120 grams of carbs per hour when sometimes 60 grams can feel tough they must be constantly eating thanks for the help all the best josh thanks josh yeah there is lots to unpack and i would say yes they are constantly eating a lot of the time in terms of the the kind of the types of carbs as as we just discussed it's definitely good to have have a mix and have a range in there and how you spread that out is up to you it's good to to break it up and have them spread out but then when you're talking about the idea of having a bit more of the real foods at the start and going to kind of more of the gels and cheese. I think that is also a great idea. I I crewed um, the Norwegian 24-hour record in 2021 and the guy started out with lots of his real foods and sandwiches and got sick of them quite early on and then went straight to gels and relied gels heavily for the rest of it. But that's just what worked for him at that time. And I think Again, testing and trialing, I think it is, as we said with the Dragon's Back, it's like good to have it spread out and have some as incentives as well. But whatever works for you with all of that, trialing, trial and error, testing, find find the best way that you can do it. And then in terms of the quantities, the the 90, 120 is, is a lot. And those athletes are elite athletes working at a, a really massive, relatively high intensity. And that's why they're able to burn and use that amount of fuel and take that amount in. And also they've done a lot of gut training. They're eating a lot in their sessions and races. And that's built up over years and years of really fueling well in their sessions and being able to tolerate those high quantities and at times like i said previously like for dragons back 60 might be absolutely fine for the race that you're doing the intensity that you're going at and the duration that you're aiming for so it's about finding and and knowing the carbohydrate recommendations for yourself based on what you're doing and what you can tolerate and you might do some gut training to to increase and reach higher levels Um, but it might not be that you need 90 for your race or especially not 120 at all times. With a race like UTS, it's really worth looking at the profile of that race as well, because what you're eating, depending on what terrain you're running on, will really dictate as well. And we know that they're really busy races and there's lots of people. So I think the first few hours are quite, going to be quite stressful. Lots of people um, trying to find space on the trail might be a bit like you're working harder than you want to because you're kind of in a bit of a conga line. Your heart rate might be elevated as well because that all adds sort of like nervous anxiety i find that that's when it's easier to take the gels and the chews because your tummy is a little bit a bit you're a little bit jittery perhaps you haven't got the time to get stuff out as well then when you settle and the race settle that might be the time that you want to then you've got a little bit more time or on a descent a nice cruise not a technical descent or on a on a sort of quite easy climb you might think yep yeah, i'm gonna have my sandwich there so a little bit of pre-planning as well you might find the reverse in training though you might find it easier to start with the solid fuel because obviously if you're just on a training run with yourself or your dog or your mate or whatever there's not that jeopardy that high intensity of that start of the race so you might find you have to switch it within the race so just being flexible josh it's all about being flexible um also just be aware where it was a really hot day at uts last year and they didn't have enough water so anybody thinking of going to the uts races be 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 thinking now how can i carry myself two liters of water um making sure that you can carry enough water so that you can and putting electrolytes into all your water so i'd be um i'd be really carefully thinking through my fueling strategy if i was doing that race and also being quite uh self-sufficient for one of those races as well being aware of how busy it was last year heat's a good uh, thing to bring up actually because i remember with dragon's back race as the day got hotter and hotter that really changed with the type of nutrition that I wanted to eat as the day went on. And then I, I learned from day one, I knew that was going to be the plan for the week. So the bars, the crisps and everything that would take a long time to maybe consume, they were eaten before the sun came up. And then the gels and the chews were the afternoon afternoon treats. 
I think on a multi day as well, your fueling is quite different after the first day because you're in a calorie deficit. So you're quite, you can shove stuff down a bit more easily because you're hungry. Like as soon as you start running, whereas when you do a 50K, you've had a taper and your glycogen stores are quite full. And so you might not feel like eating within that like first hour, even that first two hours. And that's when lots of people then, then it all goes wrong because they haven't put the carbs in as well. Whereas day two, day three of Dragon's Back, you're just like, I'll eat anything. It's off the floor. I don't care. I just eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you watch beeps eat my goodness me do not miss miss an opportunity next question from paul ravenscroft the ph floor gel instructions say that it must be consumed within 24 hours in a race perhaps that works but for training runs where i do consume 300 grams of carbs i will mix up my intake and won't take them all via gels does it need to be consumed within 24 hours right i've, I've rolled the dice quite a few times with the recommended consumption date. Sports nutrition and the cost can add up. So I understand where Paul is coming from, but yeah, does it? What kind of what kind of t window have we got, Emily? Yeah, it's a good question. And one we do get asked quite often because it's obviously on the, on the packaging and it is best before date. So not a use by date. So it's actually to do more with how it can affect the actual taste and, and texture of the gel if you, if you have it open. It's more to do with the kind of bacteria getting in. So really what you can do is if you're planning to to use it for one session, maybe half of it, and then you want the other half in another session. You'd ideally want to decant it, do the lid up as tight as you can, and keep it in a fridge. And it would be absolutely fine to use kind of in the next couple of weeks. But it's all about making sure that you put it in a fridge, store it, and the lid's back on, bacteria can't get in. Instead of like, if you had it in a bottle and took it with you, and then you've got what's left and you want to use that again that's not going to be as ideal and not keep as well it's important that you keep it in the fridge and also then when you go to use it and take it out the fridge you let it you get it get back to room temperature nice consistency and it'll flow again oh super good tip that one see i would have just left it in my bag for a week oh you of course you would and then you'd have probably just re-drank it the old bottle God, oh, yeah. like my kids <laughs> ideally ideally like it's designed to used all at once but i see yeah in training definitely you might you might break it up a bit and that's the best way to do it mark bellis next question hi i'm currently training for my first ultra good job mark 100k over two days in the peak district i'm also an independent type 1 diabetic just to throw something else in the mix i'm currently using a mix of energy juice bars and electrolytes i'm wondering if you'd had any experience with diabetics running ultras and how they feeled thanks mark yeah another another great question and, and a trickier question and um we do kind of get this to come up often in, in customer calls and bits and pieces like that. And firstly, I think it's important to say that I'm not like a, I'm not a medical professional. So with that kind of those kind of questions, it's important to go to a doctor when you're thinking of changing bits and pieces and fueling differently and, and like that. But we have worked with lots of diabetic athletes. And I think one of the main takeaways for me is that the fueling isn't isn't too different. It is still based greatly on the event that they're doing, the duration and intensity, and often the, the actual quantities of fuel and the way they're fueling is is very similar. It's just being a bit more uh, heightened awareness of, of what you're doing. And, and again, a bit of trialing and testing, but obviously it's definitely really helpful to do the kind of real-time glucose monitoring, things like that, and just getting idea of, of the trends and what can cause spikes and trying to be as consistent as you can with your intake. But it's just being, yeah, aware of what your goals are and, and being really really strict with it and keeping an eye on it where you can um but i'd say not not too dissimilar in terms of the recommendations would there be would that be a worry that he's got to go over two days so could he if he doesn't fuel or something goes wrong on the first day could that really affect his insulin levels the second day um does he need to kind of carefully think about electrolytes and carbs for that overnight as well i think i would say yes but then that's the same for someone who's a non-diabetic as well if you're not feeling yeah. well enough the first day it's going to be really tricky the second day so similarly to a diabetic and a non-diabetic it's really important that the first day you're doing everything as well as you can to make sure that it's much nicer for you on the second day like like with the dragon's back the multi-day like if you're not doing enough on days one and two, by day five, you're going to be kind of in the bin and struggling a lot. So it's important that you're proactive as you can be on day one and then pretty spot on on day two, but there's a bit more flexibility. I think putting my coaching hat on here, Mark, having a little practice of some double days as well would be really handy for that fueling, working out, yeah, watching your glucose and seeing what happens with it, not only on the first day, on, but 
maybe over when you stop and in the evening and then for the next day as well may, maybe you might need to change the fueling a little bit on the second day or it might just be it might just be that you can carry the same thing but it might be interesting to feel how you feel as well in to practice that on, in a home environment where you've got access to lots of different foods you um, and overnight you're also at home and so if you do need anything extra you've got that sort of just to, Preparation is key, I think, with anything like that. Um, having prepared and felt the feelings before two hundred k over two days is hard enough as well. Um, so kudos to you, Mark. Do let us know how you get on. I was curious though, what about if one of our listeners is a type two diabetic? Anything different for type two? Someone with type two diabetes? I don't believe so. I think the recommendations would stay similar from what I've seen and spoke to. But with all of it, worth talking to a doctor. And I say yeah. with the. Uh, with the testing and trialing, keep an eye on it as much as you can with the monitors and, and yeah, just try things out, but be careful with it. I know with what you said with the multi-day, when diabetics carb load, you just have to be a bit more sensitive and, and stagger that out a bit more. So it might be that that kind of comes into a multi-day. Yeah, you might have to wake up at two o'clock and have a st- extra snack to keep that to keep the carb level, I guess. Um, I'd be, I'd be re- yeah, I'd be really interested to know how you get on, Mark. Last question comes from Nicola Pauli. Is there anything to be done to reduce getting a stitch? I seem to sometimes get a stitch even at easy efforts and having liquid calories to make it easier to digest. Solid foods are worse, so need to walk after. I'm trying to train my stomach by eating slightly closer to running, but it just doesn't seem to make a difference to getting a stitch. I've got no idea why Why do we get a, a stitch? Yeah, so it's a tricky one. Again, it's similar to other issues and probably why you don't know the answer is because the kind of actual mechanisms, the physiological mechanisms, we know roughly the different reasons for it, but not really, there's not really one cause and there's not really proven, okay, this is why a stitch occurs. Um, But data shows kind of what makes stitches more likely. And part of that is to do with the timings and the quantities of, of fueling before exercise. So if you're ingesting close to exercise, it can increase it can increase stitches and also depending on what that is if you have more fuel closer to exercise if you're eating a lot then that can increase the likelihood of a a stitch and also if you're having lots of hypertonic which is really carb rich fluids like maybe nicola has been implementing depending on the the fuel that she's been having in, in those drinks that can also increase the likelihood so it might be that you'd manipulate a few of those factors to see if it improves um and also you'd want to make sure that your hydration side of things, which we haven't discussed quite as much, is is as spot on as can be because it's to do with the kind of blood flow to that area. And when you're dehydrated, that decreases and that could increase the, the stitches. So it's important that your hydration is spot on for you. You're not too dehydrated. And also the fueling side of things, you might manipulate the timings of fuel beforehand. Find what works best for you. It might be that you're eating more, but further out. From, from exercise and using less kind of hypertonic fluids. Uh, every All of them are like, you just go practice something different. Don't keep doing the same thing that you're doing <laughs> and try and do something different. Funnily, a lot of the questions we had were carb questions rather than drinking questions, um, electrolyte questions. What, Emily, putting you on the spot a bit, but what is the, do you have like a main question that people ask about fluid i tell you what i'll ask you one one that i get asked a lot should we force ourselves to drink or should we drink to thirst when we're running ah you yeah. love it it's, good it's, one, it's a good question it is a good question again it depends on the event and what they're doing and who it is and their losses and bits and pieces like that i think it's great to have a strategy but there are definitely times where drinking to thirst is completely adequate a lot of the time in training in shorter in colder conditions but it's important that people with higher losses, people going into hot races, especially long races, that they've got a bit more of a strategy and therefore you might drink a bit more. But I would never say that people need to force loads and loads of fluid down. A lot of it is about listening to your body as well. But you might go in instead with more of a strategy of, okay, I'm going to aim to drink this much per hour, listen to my body, drink to thirst, drink more if I am thirsty and my losses are picking up, drink less in in terms of if it's a bit cooler and you're not feeling or sweating as much. Um, But I would never kind of force it down and you don't want stomach issues, you don't want that sloshing around. So going in with a strategy and in certain situations that might just be drink to thirst. But a lot of the time in these really long ones that we've been talking about today, it is likely that you'll want to do a bit of, have a bit of a plan going in on how much you're going to be drinking. And that depends greatly on 
on your sweat losses, really. We discussed a kind of sweat loss protocol that I could maybe do at home. Yeah, if you could share that with listeners, you know, if they're not close to precision fuel and hydration and want to get a bit of a handle on how much they are sweating, what would, what should they do? Yeah, and this is actually something I discuss with athletes every day. I think it's one of the main tips of, of pieces of advice that I give when we're talking about hydration because I always get asked just how much should I drink and how much should I drink per hour and that's really hard for me to kind of just tell someone, okay, you need to drink 500 mil per hour because it depends yeah. so much depending on them and the weather conditions. So doing sweat rate data collection, which is what I asked Gary to do, can be really helpful. So all it involves is weighing yourself before and after sessions, so jumping on some bodyweight scales and taking into account whether you did drink anything during those sessions as well. Um, but a kilogram equals a litre, so you can quite easily work out your fluid losses. And what you'd want to do is do as much of that data collection that you can. Obviously, I I like data collection and, and the numbers, but if you if you have lots of sessions, it's quite easy to do and just keep track of. Um, we have a, a really good blog on, on it on our website that contains a spreadsheet that I always kind of send people to that you can just enter the data into. And ultimately what you want to do is a range of intensities, maybe a range of disciplines, and also a range of conditions. So some hot sessions, some cold ones, do that data collection and see what actually is your sweat rate. Is it a litre per hour? Is it two litres per hour? Could it drop as low as 300 mil an hour? Or like if you're a really sweaty person, how high can it get? And do a lot of that data collection, see what your losses are like. And that will just help you put a plan in place for how much you should be drinking. And not because you need to drink 100% of your losses. That's something definitely important to clarify, but it can just help you put a plan in place so that when you're going for these multi-day events, these really long events, and you've got hours and hours, that you don't build up too great a deficit. And you can work that out with the percentage body weight change. So that's the level of dehydration. Keeping that to a minimal level, some dehydration is definitely expected, but two to four percent in that kind of range. So you can put a plan in place, okay, I need to drink roughly this much per hour to avoid over hours and hours and hours building up too big a deficit. And then yeah. that'll give you an idea. But as we said, a lot a lot of it's about listening to your body as well. That might change a bit on the day. The plan might go a bit out the window, but just having that in the back of your head in a rough guideline is really helpful. You can't, can't compare yourself to James and I did an eight hour day in the Lake District and I drank and we didn't there wasn't a great deal of water sources, like clear water sources where we were. And I drank uh what two liters plus about eight cups of tea and he drank two hundred milliliters and a black coffee throughout the day. And I I finished and I was like, I'm so dehydrated. It's like, I feel fine. I actually feel fine. He obviously was lying and he was a bit dehydrated, but we are so all so different to, so don't ever feel like you're so-and-so to so-and-so doing your own tests must be, it's so vital. Practice, practice, practice. Well, if you spend a fortune on an event, you've done all the training, then yeah, that has to be part of the puzzle because that could really derail your we well, we know. <laughs> Let's listen back to Eddie's last two uh, sad post-race podcasts of derailment. But don't be, don't be Eddie. Don't be that girl. <laughs> Practice. Oh my goodness me! That forty-five minutes that passed super quick. Thanks, Emily. There's so many nuggets. Thanks to all the questions too that our Patreon sent in. Hopefully, it helps and our wider audience too. Yeah, loads of loads of little gold nuggets there. But before we go. We're going to do the quick, quick five questions. Now, these are deep. Hope you're ready for this. Um, oh, well, you mentioned um, playing football earlier. World Cup final, you are playing in it. Who would be your dream opponent? Opponent? Oh, yeah. not a teammate. Well, I'll have to pick someone that I like because I'd like to meet them. Messi. He wouldn't be my dream <laughs> opponent because I would lose, but I would just love to meet him and play oh, well, you never know. <laughs> against him. So I would say... That would be a... Oh my goodness me, yeah. Awesome. Do you have a precision fuel and hydration product? That's really tough. I'm going to say the original chews, uh, but also like the bucket hats because I love the bucket hats. Oh, yeah. Oh, I have a quick question about the chews. Can you? So if you... So what I do with my chews is I open them all up and I put them in a sandwich bag and th th this is gross Emily you'll find this gross but I carry that and then if I'm doing like a multi-day or even a, like a, my next like super long race it will they will stay in the bag for quite a long time um and then I'll leave it there till my next long run this is gross can you put like icing sugar I heard what did I hear was it icing sugar to like um to keep them like so they don't all get stuck together was that a good tip did I hear that you're nodding you're not yeah. being repulsed. yeah yeah no there's definitely quite a few athletes that I work with that do that kind of that kind of thing to keep it 
keep it fresh. Like they have the like icing on them, right? But it'll which is it'll so good. It. It's the best bit. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, no, that definitely works. Especially if you're going to keep it in just like one bag with them all together. That's a good way to do it. Okay. I love that. Like That's the Turkish next thing. Delight. If you can take that to the to Precision Fuel and Hydration Towers as well, like can we have them like just in a bag, a jiffy bag, so I don't have to unwrap less weight, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, that would be an awesome idea. Yes. Yeah, they would all clump it, together though. You just get one big together. clump of chew. You would. <laughs> you, this is what happens. So icing sugar, I'm going to add that to my shopping list. Eddie and I have famished. We've come banging out your door, Emily. We need We've feeding. We've not fueled well. We have not fueled well <laughs> on our long run. We are. What are you going to cook us? What is your signature dish? <laughs> okay, I've got one, but the office will take the mick out of me because it's like what I have for dinner like every day. <laughs> and I have, I've only just come out of being a student, so it's definitely a pasta dish. Um, and it's my tomato bacon pasta. Oh, nice. Yeah. I'm I'm happy with a pasta Bit of salt, dish. bit of carb. Yeah, yeah, yeah love it. Yeah, love quick. It, it, It'll be quick because we get grumpy within about 10 minutes. <laughs> Well, it's not going to re probably rewind the years that much, actually. But yeah, we're going to rewind the clock a bit to your teenage years. What posters were on your wall, Emily? Uh, lots of footballers. Messi. Uh, Messi, Neymar. Um, some some films, TV shows. I definitely had David Tennant um, from Doctor Who uh, for a long time on my walls. Oh. That's normally one of our questions, actually. Yeah, what would be your guilty TV pleasure? Doctor Who doesn't sound like a guilty TV pleasure. I mean, these days, I guess so. Um, guilty TV pleasure. Like I below just watched deck, the um, kind of yeah, thing. I just watched the final of the Great Pottery Showdown. <laughs> oh, I that love great. that. Joe raising love... the bar, Emily. We're, <laughs> we're That's very cultural. <laughs> we're in the gutter. That is very cultural. The last one I watched was when they were making the fountains and they had like all the snakes going round and oh, that blows my mind that people can do stuff like that because I struggle with like a cupcake. I think it's just because I've been home and my parents watch it all the time, but I really, really got into it. It's got to be that and uh, also any game show. I love Richard Osman's House of Games. Oh, like my gosh. All oh, those game shows. They just <laughs> hit my kids love those. And I'm like, this, why are we? What? They're like, we got to find out the chaser of the. I don't I think the problem is I don't understand them. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. Last question is, every week we share the podcast over on Instagram, Emily, and uh, yeah, we would give you the power for the Instagram story music. What song should we put with your Instagram story? Wow. It has to be Taylor Swift. Um, oh, yes. Just trying to think of what, what song. It's too many. Too many good ones. While you're thinking, I heard that a Taylor Swift concert ticket was £600. Ooh. Is that a joke? Is that a joke? That doesn't surprise me. I'm actually, I'm going to the Eras tour this year, but I haven't paid 600 <laughs> Okay. I think it was a resell one. I think it's the resell one that get really expensive. Uh, I listened to something, Snoop Dogg, he was telling about how much money he earned from Spotify from like millions of streams. And it wasn't a lot of dosh for all those people listening to his songs. So I think, yeah, as much as $600 is eye-watering, I think that's where they make the money, isn't it, these days? Okay, I've made the I've made the okay, decision. Just made the decision. Um, okay. I'm gonna go for ready for it, Taylor Swift. Ready. It's a great one. Oh. She must drink electrolyte on that tour. Because we've all heard about her doing treadmill sessions and singing as she's doing them. She must be backstep. This is a this is a new sponsor. If you guys ever, you know, you'll never leave us. But if you decide to leave the podcast, Taylor Swift. Oh, so Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> we'd, we'd take that if you wanted to talk. Wow, could you she imagine definitely... the sales would go through the roof if you had Taylor Swift on a treadmill? You just need Taylor with the bottle in one of her, like, amazing dresses. Yeah. Backstage. Like snacking on a chew between oh, songs or something. Amazing. When you're there, if you're in distance, Emily, just chuck your book a cap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Oh, I love it. Emily, thank you so much for taking up the time to come. Well, but take up the time to chat to Gary and I, and also coming on the podcast now as well. We've loved talking to you. I know that people will take away. You might, you're changing lives, Emily. People listening and learning and helping people. It's such a big part of ultra running, and it's the most complicated part. Everyone says running's easy, but putting on your trainers, that's the easy bit. The fueling is tricky and it's hard to get right. So hopefully, Emily, you've pointed many people in the right direction. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast awesome thanks for having me thanks emily cheers see you soon bye
Thanks, Emily. And what a treat it is to have access to people with so much knowledge. I always learn something every day as a school day, Eddie. Uh, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed our conversation with Emily. Straw, but heavy on the hardmost 55, <gasps> I think, this weekend. Yeah, Phil Tickner, 66.3 miles with an average pace for the week of nine of minutes, course. 51 seconds, 9,587 feet. Yeah, he completed the hardmost 55 12th overall, Phil. Heavy flex. Well done. It looked like an awesome day. Super windy and fresh in the north, but the pictures, yeah, looked stunning. Lloyd Watkin, 85 miles with an average pace of 12 minutes and 41 seconds, 12,648 feet. He was doing, I'm not too sure if it was an event or just yeah, a self. Yeah, it's an event. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the Jurassic Coast Challenge over three days. Absolutely awesome. That looked wild. And Lindsay Collins. She has been on the Run to the Hills podcast many, wowzers, how many, what, two, three years ago? 66.5 miles, 13 minutes and 32 seconds average pace, 9,324 feet. She's a request to follow, but I'm certain she <laughs> towed the line on the hard moors 55 too. Yeah, well done, everybody. And another bumper week of merch out on the trails. Thank you so much, everybody who represents and then shares some pictures on our Facebook group. The only thing that would have made Jasmine's victory any sweeter would have been if she'd been ro rocking a tea and trails snood on her arm. Maybe we'll just send her one to say congrats. Well, it's, you know, she's a green runner. I don't think she needs a snood. She, she might just need one. She might say, I haven't got enough and it's something I'm going to use for the rest of my life and treasure. She can have one then. <laughs> Tales from the Trails. Just a quickie this week, Tales from the Trails. I just finished my longest long training run for last year's London Marathon. Oh, Gary knows how you feel. As soon as I got in, my wife informed me that we had to leave in 15 minutes to take my daughter to a four-year-old's fairy-themed birthday party. And we, if we weren't on time, we'd miss the fairy. Oh my gosh, the jeopardy. Oh, this is my life, Tim. I jumped in the shower with no warm down, got in the car and drove us 90 minutes to the party, needing a chicken sandwich on the way. My legs were not happy about it. However, we did get there just on time and got to meet the fairy. Not that rock and roll, but that was a matter of life and fairy. Oh, too good. Tim Wellbrook, we've all been there. There's nothing worse than long run or session or really any run and then sitting in the car. <gasps> the oh, car. Oh, and then you're like, sometimes I sit in the car and I'm like, I can't take the creakiness of getting out of the car. So I sit in the car and do my emails and stuff. And then kids are like, are you coming in, mum? I'm like, oh, okay, help me out, kids. When we drive back from the lakes, oh, it's like my God. five hours, two hour drive. Oh my goodness me. No fun at all. Thanks, Tim. We love sharing your tales from the trails. Keep them coming in. Please email. Email. We've asked for lots of emails. Hello at tntrails.com. Just email because Gary loves loads of emails in his inbox. Nothing he likes more than a full inbox. <laughs> I thought we were going to get a whole show without any smuts. I see nothing. You know what I love more than the five-star review, Eddie? Me. Nope. <laughs> An uh, international carbon, five-star. Carbon-plated shoes. <laughs> oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> international five-star review. And this one comes all the way from Canada. Hello. Bonjour. My name is Nicole. I am from a small island on the east coast of Canada, Prince Edward Island, I think. I might have been there. And I am a huge fan of the podcast. I share your podcast as much as possible. I am an ultra runner and currently training for my fifth ultra and first 24-hour race with a goal of 100 kilometers. I've tried listening to some North American podcasts on running, but I find the American accent so boring and serious. <laughs> I love listening to you both. I often find myself smiling and laughing out loud. I appreciate your honesty and authenticity because, well, I try and be authentic and I believe the world needs more of that. The podcast is also very educational and informative. I can't wait to sign up for a race your way one day. Maybe Dragon's Back or Lakeland 100. 100% oh, recommend both of those. Thank you for being you. Sending five stars from afar. 
bless. That's Nikki2424. Fire Apple Podcasts all the way from Canada. Oh, thanks, Nikki. What a review. Yeah, 100%. Well, best of luck with your 24-hour race. And if you are ever over in these shores, two awesome races. I think if you're going to travel across the world, you've got to go big. That's what they always say. If you're going to travel, go big. <laughs> Thank you all so much for your lovely five-star reviews, for liking, for sharing, for subscribing. I've got a little job for everybody now, though. I've got a little bit of work to do. I know you've all got a lot on your plate. I know you're all juggling a lot. I know it's all a lot, but this is just one little, this this little, little thing I'm going to ask you to do. We want you to share the podcast. Like, tell your mate, tell the person that makes your morning latte, tell the guy at the petrol station, uh, you run past somebody, flash them your buff, just your buff. All right, Gary. And say, <laughs> have you listened to the Dean Trails podcast? Let's get the word out there. And I think the way, the best way to do it is by word of mouth. I'm a big believer in that. So perhaps you're running group, perhaps you're running club, perhaps at a race, just strike up conversation. It's a great conversation starter. If people haven't listened to the podcast, then all you need to do, get it, get open up on your phone, play it into their ears, pull them around. Or sit on them. <laughs> or sit on them, did you say? Or sit on them. <laughs> sit on them. <laughs> <laughs> just sit on that if haven't listened to the podcast and if it's been shared with you let us know we we love hearing all the stories I love hearing I can't keep up with the Facebook group now um, when I go on there's so much great stuff happening so thank you so much if you do share and thank you so much for just loving the podcast big love yeah I feel pretty rotten because I can't keep up with the Facebook group too but yeah we see it all we love it all we appreciate it all too we've got a competition winner well two winners actually so yeah our beated sports competition winners and thanks for everybody who shared and to all our lovely Patreons too the winners are Daniel Abbott and legend Patreon Jane Smith I will pass on your deets pretty sure I've got your emails and your addresses actually pretty sure both he's got everyone's pitch. remember Gary knows where you live <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll pass all your information on to the team at Beat It Sports. And yeah, you get your lovely prizes sent off to you. Do you think if we offered you as a prize, the podcast would go viral? If we were like competition time, win a night to the cinema with Gareth Waits. Or Did they used to do that. They had these auctions, didn't they, for people? Oh, <gasps> we could auction you off for charity. <laughs> <laughs> The he's shaking ever. his head, but I'm pretty sure he's quite up for this. A night in the cinema, you bring the treats, you know, one of your film. specials, recovery shake, recovery shake and some marshmallows. Oh, yeah. Better for yeah. you, recovery shake, Ghostbusters, love it. Ghost, um, the kids are desperate to see Ghostbusters and I'm like, that library scene, it scarred me when I was that a child. I might get the mozzie in about four years' time, will it, Ghostbusters? Oh, no, not cinema, it's well up there, it's Pretty, I tell you what, talking of the cinema, so the cinema's on our main little street in Morzine, and uh, there was a huge fire yesterday. 50 oh firemen my. it took to put the Oof. fire out. The boulangeries burnt down, two restaurants, two cafes. Oh, my goodness. Everybody was fine. Everyone was alive. So I felt it was okay that I was raging that the cafe had burnt down, and that was my... <laughs> It's pretty Stop wild. It. Big fire. It's wild, but then they make these buildings out of wood, Gary. It's crazy. But the cinema, I saw uh, I saw the guy who owns the cinema. I <laughs> just cinema's all right. Yeah, cinema's all right. Yeah, Ghostbusters will come to the cinema in French. I will not be watching it. I won't watch the new one. I won't watch the old one, Gary. It's terrifying. You're so sensitive, Eddie. I couldn't believe it. It's about ghosts, Gary. I have to run through the night. Why would I put that into my head? And why would I put that into my kid's head? Have it you ever had a, a ghost? experience. No, I don't even want to talk about it, Gary. I don't want to go there. There's people <laughs> listening to this that are running on their own. We don't know because I know <laughs> you saying that means you want to share something that's going to freak me out. It Rin, would freak me out too. Lisa Rin always says to me, the, me the little girl's upstairs. She says Ooh. she can't stand. I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Lisa shared me. something in our old... No, we had, we had a no, flat. no, stop. I don't. Okay. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Yeah, my mum, we lived in a really old house and she shared something that happened in the old house when I was growing up there. And I was like, if you told me that when we were living there, I would have never come home. Anyway, anyway, let's not freak people out. What's com what's coming up, Gary? What you doing? Come on. Tip of time. Tip of tip of time. <laughs> I've got some workouts, but I'm just saying, yeah, I'm not too sure if I'm going to be bothered to do them, but I will. Just, Maybe not you today. Just, you just gaslighted a 
whatever it is by me saying I said I didn't do my workout today I'm going to do it tomorrow and you're like well I can't do that because I'm a marathon runner and I've actually got to run a pace Eddie I can't just walk around the mountains for four days and deliberately gaslight <laughs> <laughs> so yes yeah, taper time and I love taper time so it's yeah lighter weights for me sessions reduced in size apart from I've got one of those marathon pace sessions too over the weekend lots of mobility and form roll I just find I've got a bit more time to do that just get all those nuts and creases ironed out Lent is over for another year and I think not till Easter Sunday Mr Thwaites oh yes okay fair enough but I'm going to keep going with it I might have a little nibble on Easter Sunday I'm going to keep on going all the way through to the marathon but yeah I am looking forward to a bit of chocolate I've got Cadbury's cream egg that's hot on my list no you're not fancy <laughs> i love a cream egg i like a little nibble nibble on the end until i can see the cream and that's uh... <laughs> and then i just uh finish it no, off as quick stop as possible. it <laughs> <laughs> but i'm working on you might be able to answer me a question here i'm working yes, on the no. suntour race review i'm wearing two watches what a massive idiot on my suntour race i can't set or maybe I can, I just can't work out to do it. I can't set an alert to beep 20 minutes, 30 minutes, just to r- okay, remind yeah. me to eat. Can you do that on your vertical? I don't know. I'll check yeah. for you. I'll have a look. That's a game changer. That's like, if they can't do that, like, I, you know, spoiler, I absolutely love the watch. It's fantastic. And for the price, I don't really think there's much out there that gives it a run for its money. But when I'm in the trenches at mile 20 and that watch isn't telling me to wait, I might just um, mm, dip into mm, the dip into that mm. reserves a bit too much. So, yeah, if they can do that or if it can be done, if anyone's listening who's got a I don't. I personally don't set the alert on my watch because it... it I, it's just a waste because after a day, I don't know why it's beeping at me and I get all... I only want it to beep at me when I go off course, basically. Uh, if you're a Sunto user, perhaps, Sunto yeah. vertical user, did you set it to eat or drink? Let Gary know. Save me a job. <laughs> and that's it. Hopefully, you know, don't want anything too drastic to happen now. Just one, two or three weeks, wrapped up in cotton wool, get me on that start line. And that is that. Yeah, fingers crossed to get that review out. But it's super tricky. I thought I'd get a review out every week. And that is proving trickier than I thought. But uh, yeah, what about yourself? I'm actually proper tapering. You're sort of pretend tapering this week. You're telling yourself you're tapering, but you still do 80 miles. I am actually tapering. I've been tapering for like the last (laughs) six weeks. (laughs) This is the lowest volume of training, running training I've ever done into a big race and the lowest volume of like cross training because I had to sacrifice that time for the weights. So let's see, let's see what happens. Even if it doesn't pay off and I end up, you know, whatever happening, I definitely will keep that strength program in my life now forever. I love the way it makes me feel. I love the fact that my pecs are rock hard. And if you've got boy kids as well, I just love the fact that they've got peas on strings, as I call them on their arms. (laughs) (laughs) And I can arm wrestle them. I love feeling strong. I love feeling strong. I don't really care what my body looks like. My body is a functional. (laughs) I just want to use it and abuse it. I I love that it feels really strong. So I will carry on with that. So uh, I'll just probably do much the same this week as I did last week, because it wasn't mega last week. I'm only going to do one workout, as I said, which is why I said I could not do it today and I'm going to do it tomorrow because it's a day for going up mountains and enjoying the sunshine today. I'm a bit more organic like that with my training than you are, Gary. Yeah, I'll do the gym. Probably only do two this week. Lots of ski racing happening and there, there's no weights now. Like still doing squats, you know, same old lifts, squats, but 10 sets, not six. Tell you please. Uh, nice light, just lots of movement. Going to see the chiropractor tonight, Gary. Oh, God, I hate it. Ooh. He's so mean to me. He hates the fact that I run such a long way. And so he has no sympathy. And <laughs> oh, what he does to my body, it's illegal. But it's also good as well. I dread it. But he inflicts pain, but I feel so much better afterwards. So I'm going to go and see it. All the, like the national ski championships and everything are happening. It's so dull for anybody listening, but there's a lot going on. There's so much. I got everything wrong the last week of what skis, races, where, who. I mean, literally probably take the wrong child to the wrong ski race because it's really hard when you've got a race of this enormity coming up 
because it's what you want to think about and prepare for, but life is just carrying on. You don't have that time. You don't have that headspace. I find that really hard this week, that juggle. I made a few errors last week with kids going to the wrong places and stuff. So I, but I think it's good for the kids. So I was like, give me a bit of grace, kids. I'm really sorry. I got you there. We did it. We all, it all got sorted at the end. That was all a bit stressful. I do wonder with WhatsApp, I digress, Gary, slightly. I know you want to have your lunch, but what does like happen before the internet? Like, how did all this, did kids just not do all this stuff without WhatsApp groups and... You used to get a letter home, didn't you, from school? That was it. You got a letter, out. didn't you? Because your mum signed the permission slip for the so-and-so, but you couldn't make like these last minute changes and like all this stuff. It was just, maybe life was a lot more tranquil. Maybe we should start a no 100%. more WhatsApp. And also, when people add you to groups, you should be able to not want to, I don't want to be added. I don't want to be added to that birthday party group. I don't want to be added to that. I'm not going. If you add me to a party... Who are you talking to, are you? (laughs) (laughs) Who's added you to a group? (laughs) I don't know. You add me to a WhatsApp group, but I'm not going to be going out. If it's past seven o'clock at night, if your party is at 10 o'clock and it involves a run and then a cup of tea, I'll be there. I can't wait. (laughs) If it involves skiing or generally being outside doing something and then tea, cake, I'm in there. If it's past jammy time, you're not going to get so don't, How many WhatsApp groups are you in? I'm literally probably in about four, five. While we record this, my phone does not stop because for every single sport the kids do, which they're many, they all have a WhatsApp group. So times that by like, there must be like 20 sports WhatsApp group, huge long WhatsApp messages. And they're all in French, obviously. And I can totally find, I can read the French, but it takes, I can miss stuff, I think, in the French. Yeah. Because I skim read it, like I skim read everything in life. <laughs> anyway, I'm really sorry. I just thought if you have WhatsApp anxiety like I do when it says, so-and-so's added you to the group for the eighth birthday at the lake with the barbecue. Please bring sausages, change of clothes, a chicken, uh, a dry cloth and a small mobile car. But yeah, you're right. I don't know how I keep it all together. <laughs> I think like you're right. Life was so much simpler. I had a conversation with someone just the other day. I, I feel my life should be slowing down, you know, I'm, 50 year old, but it just gets faster and faster and faster and more and more and things just seem to encroach my time. If we didn't have WhatsApp though, Gran- <laughs> Granny, <laughs> <laughs> if we didn't have WhatsApp, Gary, we wouldn't have each other because there wouldn't be Zoom. You and I, it swings in roundabouts, say. So yes. Ying and yang. Ying <laughs> and That is it. Another show in the bank. You all rock. Hope you're having an awesome weekend listening to us too for a couple of hours. Grab a cuppa and break off a bit of your favourite Easter egg. And thanks to Precision Fuel and Hydration for sponsoring this week's show. Use the code T24 for 15% off your first order. And thanks to our partners and Patreons too. We couldn't do this without you guys. Yeah, really appreciate your ongoing support. Be kind to your future self. Breathe and believe. Progress, not perfection. Keep your shield high. Be asked. I'm a new one. Don't know if this one's going to get past Gary, but in honour of Jasmine, run to the barrier. Don't ever stop till you reach that barrier. Do you like that? I love it. Oh, Oh, it's in. It's in, guys. It's in. My name is Eddie Sutton. And I'm Gary Thwaites. And that was episode 64 of the Tea and Trails podcast. (laughs)